This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 1 of the podcast. My name is Pam Barnhill, and I am your host. I am the homeschooling mom of three children, ages 10, 8, and 5. A few years ago, I stumbled onto the practice of morning time on the blog of Cindy Rollins, and we started implementing this practice into our homeschool, slowly at first, gradually adding more, and it has been such a blessing to us in our family. Little did Cindy know, 27 years ago, when she started practicing memory verses with her little four-year-old, I Want a Cub, that she would spark a whole generation of homeschooling women to start practicing morning time in their families. And so today, I am absolutely delighted to have Cindy on the podcast as our very first guest. We're going to start the podcast off by having Cindy explain to us a little bit about what morning time looked like in her family, how she got started with the practice, and how it grew and really bore fruit in her family over all of those many, many years. In future episodes of the show, We'll be speaking with experts and homeschooling moms alike a little bit more about the different practices that take place in morning time and ways that you can bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool family. We hope to dig deep into some of the philosophy behind the practices of morning time and also to help unpack those practices and make them very doable come Monday morning. As we go along, you'll be able to keep up with us by subscribing to Your Morning Basket on iTunes or by visiting yourmorningbasket.com and finding the show notes for each episode on that site. For today, I hope you enjoy with me Cindy's story and the story of how morning time began. Cindy Rollins has been equipping homeschool families to do morning time for years through blog posts, interviews, and conference presentations. She is mom to nine children, eight boys and one girl, who have mostly finished their homeschool journeys. She's still got a couple more left to go. So she knows what it's like to be in the trenches, and she also knows what it's like to look back and reflect on the learning she and her children have done together. Cindy has a heart for helping and encouraging families to seek truth, beauty, and goodness together. Welcome, Cindy. Oh, welcome. And thank you very much. (laughs) I'm just so glad to have you with me here today. I'm glad to be here. It's exciting to get to know you a little bit and to talk about morning time. I think it's going to be fun. Well, could you start out by telling me in your own words, what exactly would you describe morning time as? Maybe to some, a new homeschool mom who's just hearing of it for the very first time. Well, it's kind of funny because it's really not, there's nothing profound about morning time. It's very much a a simple idea that um, just kind of blossomed in my home. But what I would say it is, it's a, it's a time and a place to get together as a family and to do some things in the morning. In a way, it's like a mini church service in the morning in your family, but with school and, and, and Christian things mixed in together, poetry, reading. It's just a place to put in an organized fashion the things that you want to have in your home, especially the really human things, the things that that do promote truth, goodness, and beauty. Well, tell us a little bit how you got started with it. Was it something you kind of fell into or did you make a conscious decision one day that you were going to start doing something new? Kind of what ideas influenced you to begin implementing morning time? Well, it was very, very, um, I had read, this was, I just talked to to, um, David Kern about this, but I had gone out and gotten the book for the children's sake on a remainder table, which is a, which is a book about Susan Schaefer Macaulay's journey and finding uh, Charlotte Mason school accidentally in England. When I read the book, I was so drawn to everything that she was saying about education. It was quite new to me. So I had that filling my heart. And then at the time I read that I had two little boys, two and a baby, my son was in Awana four. And so we were doing Bible verses every day. And I had read somewhere, it's good to do your Bible verses in the morning and at night so that you have two different kinds of brain things going on. So I started getting up in the morning and saying, let's do our Bible verse. And 
that turned into us having morning devotions every morning. And then we started to sing. And I'm a huge fan of nursery rhymes. I know every nursery rhyme. (laughs) And I continue with my granddaughters and my grandsons uh, with the nursery rhymes. So we would act out nursery rhymes. And then I started thinking about homeschooling. And we were already doing this. In fact, we were reading aloud because of uh, Susan McCauley's book. I was already gleaning that for read alouds. And we were reading aloud some some younger biographies. And some, even this, my son was only four, but we were even reading some of the signature biographies, which are probably fourth, fifth, sixth grade level, but he liked those. So it just quite naturally blossomed. Then I, one Sunday we went to church and I noticed all our pastor's kids were singing the hymns without looking at the hymnals. And I thought, wow, that would be nice for me because I'm always carrying a baby or always, you know, I'm always, the hymn book is kind of hard to hold. The next day, we added a hymn to our morning time. And then I started using a concept that I had learned in Bible college for memorizing scripture. And I think I'm reading your, through your book that you're putting out. I think you would call it loop scheduling. Mm-hmm. But that was mm-hmm. how I had memorized Bible verses in college, where you, you would say your verse every day for two weeks, and then, and then it would go in a different pile. And then you'd say a new verse every day. And then you'd say maybe that verse every other day. And then you just keep moving things into different piles. But you're once a month, you're always reviewing verses that you've learned in the past. So I incorporated that into all our memory work for morning time. So all the poems we learned, all the hymns we learned, anything we memorized, we or sang, we put it on a loop. And then so we would always have a new poem, a new Bible verse, and then something to review. And that's sort of how it got started. What I'm hearing from you about the beginnings of morning time in your home are first a couple of different things. First of all, you really started morning time before you quote unquote officially started homeschooling, right? Absolutely. That's exactly what happened. Okay. That's really fascinating (laughs) to me especially somebody, you know, as someone who's come at it from the other direction, that's really interesting that the morning time predates any kind of formal reading lesson or math lesson or anything else that you did in your home. Yes, it was well established by the time it was time to do math and reading. When when my son was five, then we, we started, you know, adding in math and reading. And really, it was already the framework for our day at that point. Oh, that's really neat. As somebody who has come into it later and kind of has that tension there between that I constantly struggle with between Mm -hmm. what I know in my heart is the value of morning time. And then all of these other things over here that throughout my own years of education, I've been told are important. I just, I'm very envious of that for you that you started that first. Yeah, it really was the Lord. You know, I do say the Lord went before me in that and really set my feet on a solid ground because in those days, There weren't a lot of ideas about homeschooling. Now it's you're so overwhelmed with information, but back then you you weren't. You just got up in the morning and looked around for information. You certainly didn't look on the internet. You had to get a catalog from someone, and you had to even hear about them. So it it was a little bit different. Not as many distractions, right? And then it very much grew organically for you. You didn't sit down one day, pen and paper in hand. And say, okay, I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to plan this out. You just started doing one thing. And then over time, you added more as you kind of came to the realization that this might be a good thing to put in your morning time. Oh, yes. And then all kinds of things would come up and I'd say, oh, that'd be perfect for morning time. And then morning time did get very unwieldy because of that. At one point, it was, you know, two, two and a half hours, which was certain Certain times in our family life, that was perfect. But then other times it got to you, that was too long. But finally, I did decide to put pen to paper and organize it. And it was funny because I didn't think about that at first. And then over the years, I gradually added strategies to streamline it because at first, every single morning it was, oh, we're reviewing this poem. What poem book was that in? You know, and, you know, I had a list of poems and I knew, you know, how we were going to review them. But I didn't keep, finally, I printed, you know, when the computer came out, then I printed out (laughs) this really ancient time, a long time ago, I printed out the poems and then we didn't even have to search for the poetry book anymore. But there's a downside to that because, you know, you get the poem book and say, oh, this is a good one. And this is a good one. And you serendipitously find something else. 
Okay, I think we need to tell everyone exactly how old is your oldest because you talked about starting this process when he was four. Right. How old is he now? He's 31. Well, he'll be 31 in a couple of weeks. So, um, yeah. And then pretty much every 22 months after that, I had another one. (laughs) Okay. And so this is like, if my math is correct, this is like 27 years ago that you actually started. Yes. Yeah. David Kern this morning uh, figured that out for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad David did the math for us. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you mentioned that at times your morning time grew to be two to two and a half hours in length. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about why in the world would you give over so much time of your school day to two and a half hours? I mean, for me, as a mom who has 10 year old is my oldest. um, Right. That's more than half of my school day right there. You know, given that, what was it that made you give over so much of your school day to this practice? Well, there was a lot of tension over it because I was doing what I loved, but then something new would come along and everybody would be doing it. Konos at that time was unit studies. And then, you know, different programs came out and they all seemed so appealing, but I would had to stop morning time in order to do a lot of those programs. So I kept my homeschool very eclectic and rather than buy some big box that, which I wouldn't have had time for. Now I did do that a couple of times and tried to do both and it really never worked. So I did keep doing other subjects, but I never got in on a whole program that would have required a lot more time for each of the other subjects. So, so we would wake up in the morning and do the kids always started math right away. So no matter when, you know, whatever happened that messed up morning time or morning time didn't get messed up, or we started late or we started on time something was going on and getting accomplished. Everybody wasn't just sitting there waiting for morning time. Mm -hmm. And then I kept on, I kept running lists for all the kids. For me, we always did the same thing every day. I try not to come. Morning time was the time for the things that you might want to rotate, but in their schoolwork, I tried to keep it so that each day they did the same thing. So their list was very simplified So there wasn't any confusion about what was required of them. And they could, there wasn't a sense of, am I doing science or am I doing, you know, art today or am I doing this or am I doing that? You know, I use morning time for drawing and all the little things I wanted. And our regular school days were for their subjects, you know, math and reading and grammar and eventually Latin or, or whatever other studies. But I didn't add a huge amount of that kind of work because years ago, I I ended up not teaching a lot of spelling because your kids, uh, you know, I found that kids are either spellers or they're not. And that when they read a lot and write a lot, that's their spelling, especially if they're writing a lot. So I did give up some subjects along the way. And I did give up the idea of fun, you know, let's just do this fun curriculum that's all together because morning time was the priority for me. Last year, one of the things I was trying to do is if you were to look at my school day, there was a segment that was morning time. And then there was a segment that would be what I would call skill work, you know, a child learning how to read or do math. And then there was this other segment that was supposed to be a complete science curriculum or a complete history curriculum or something like that on top of the work that we're already doing in those subjects at co-op. There just wasn't time for all of that (laughs) during the day. And so Fortunately, you know, I feel like I made the right choice. And that was the stuff that got that afternoon stuff was the stuff that got jettisoned that we didn't end up doing for the year and that we kept the morning time and the skill work. And I think as I go into this year, that's what I'm planning on doing is I think morning time is a rich enough feast that that plus the skill work for the children who are my kids age. Right. It's seeming to work for us. It is. It's like if you have morning time, you have some skill work and the kids are reading, you have a very rounded curriculum. And there, I never taught a formal science to my younger children. I always waited till seventh grade to add in science, but we did read a lot of scientific, you know, living books that were, were more interesting. And we were, you know, nature was important to us. So we used field guides to draw in our nature notebooks when we couldn't get out and get things, which was most of the time. They would draw in the nature notebooks while I read aloud. So they, most of my older kids have quite a nice collection of nature notebooks from their childhood. 
but that was science. And that was, you know, all that I did. I had to trust that that was enough. I looked at it like this. We have 24 hours in the day. Of course, we don't have 24 hours. Let's say we have 12. But if we're learning why we're awake, then we're doing the best we can. And the categories aren't always that important. Yes, we need to do some skill work. Skills are important. The ideas that are the way the mind develops when it's fed on ideas is very important. And that isn't always something that tests out. But I found that when the kids go to to college, they really do well because they have such a depth of thing of knowledge to pull from. Well, you mentioned in your when you were talking a few minutes ago that sometimes morning time would stretch to two, two and a half hours. And you said that there were seasons of your homeschool when that was okay. So let's talk about different seasons of homeschools, because I know that lay out a new practice in front of homeschooling moms, there tends to be some stress involved for those moms. Right. And so let's talk about different seasons that homeschool moms might be in where morning time is not going to be two and a half hours long. Yeah. And, you know, that is a problem because I always said this, you know, for me, morning time is a way to free us up. It's not intended to add more burdens to someone. It adds burdens because we don't trust, you know, the processes that we choose. And if you don't trust it, you probably shouldn't do it. There are seasons in a mother's life where, um, you know, when my kids were 10 and under and, you know, my toddlers were running around, I learned to have morning time pretty easily. I found that easier for morning time than later on when I had busy schedules and work schedules and, and a lot of other things that, you know, more than one, a almost adult in the family, people had to be at baseball practice. People had to be, you know, so now we didn't just have the whole rest of the day to catch up on everything else. Now we really did have to get done at a certain time because people were leaving and going out the door. That was a challenge for me. Whereas the babies and the toddlers, because what you said earlier about it being organic, we were just a family together doing stuff. And if you look at it like, well, we're just sitting here for two and a half hours, then no, no baby can do that. I always make kind of critical of churches who say they're family friendly, but then the longest services, you know, where children are invited, not, you know, into the service, encouraged not to go to children's church or nursery. And yet sometimes those churches have very long services. So morning time is not meant to be a service, a kind of service where everyone sits. There can be, and I think you said this in your materials, but lots of coming and going and, you know, this person can read that. And they can play with Legos and the baby nurses and then the baby is not nursing. And then it doesn't. And I have had toddlers wander off and do horrible things. So, (laughs) But there should be something organic about it, not artificial. For me, of course, it did was organic. So that was nice. But if you're trying to start it and it isn't an organic part of your day, then you must. and, And you've said this, just start small make it organic. You know, we get up and we read the Bible, a Bible verse every day and sing a song. Just do that. And then later you might say, well, we're here reading the Bible verse and singing a song. Why don't we, you know, why don't we read a poem? Why don't we memorize this poem while we're here and go about it in that way? You know, I added my reading aloud time to the end of morning time. So that's one reason why it went on so long, because I would read short snippets of three or four books following Charlotte Mason's idea of short lessons, the books that were living books, but they weren't storybooks. And then we always had at the end of morning time, our novel, you know, the one, the Tom Sawyer, or the Swallows and Amazons or the Wind in the Willows. Then we were reading those. And it was very easy for morning time to go on and on and on at that point, because everyone was enjoying the book. But I think one of the things I'm hearing you say that that worked for you, but if it didn't work for a family to do, to have that extended read aloud time at the end of a morning time, it would certainly be okay to take that out and move it to a different part of the day. Oh, absolutely. I mean, honestly, this is what worked in my family. I tried moving things around and one, there was a period of time when I had two in Ambleside that were in years one and two to get, and I decided to put them together. And so we would have morning time and they were quite young. Then they'd have phonics. And then we would do like an Ambleside time where we read aloud. Well, I had to cut morning time a little short because for them, I was going to be reading aloud to them from the Ambleside books later. So morning time was a little bit shorter for everybody else at that point. And that season, you know, when you have, you might have an intense time. 
or when you're teaching a child to read, you know, that's very intense. So you might have to just cut off some things during those seasons. But if you keep a small piece of morning time, we get together, we sit down in the morning, we talk, we say, oh, like, you know, the whole idea of morning meeting go in the morning and they'll say it's time for morning meeting and over the loudspeaker. And we're like, oh, morning meeting. (laughs) But, you know, that's just an organizational principle when you have a lot of people. So you have that, you add on whatever you want to add on and you can. And if you have dentist appointments or whatever, the day is going to be different every day. But the key is to get a little bit done every day, do a little bit each day. And hopefully, you know, over time, a little bit of poetry, a little bit of Bible, a little bit of what will add up. And honestly, it's much better to to read a little bit of poetry than a lot of poetry or to read a little bit of the, even the Bible, it's better to read sometimes a little bit of the Bible than a lot of the Bible, because you want what's going to stick in the heart. You don't want the kids to immediately tune out because, oh, here we go. The Bible, it's going to take 30 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. So if they know it's short, they can be alert and attentive. Whereas when we do too much of, of something, the kids really do tune out. That's why morning time is the key to it is not to belabor anything, but to just quietly move from thing to thing without taking too much time. Oh, I love that. Not to belabor anything. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but, good. <laughs> and then just the whole idea of you have a, a lifetime, but you have, you know, you have a good 13 or 14 years where you're sitting here with these children, giving them these little chunks every single day. And it, you know, it is going to add up over time. It really will. It will add up. It definitely does. If you're consistent enough that, you know, if you fall down, pick yourself up. That's just, you know, you didn't do it morning time. You only had, it's better to do a little bit than you know, have a big grand plan and then not do it. That's why I hate to see moms start with a full blown morning time because they can quickly feel overwhelmed before they, they see any benefit of it and then they quit. So that's not a good idea. Right. So would you say that would be your number one suggestion for somebody who's starting out is to start small? Absolutely. Absolutely. And not to feel overwhelmed and not, you know, we can't look at each other and we can't compare ourselves to how someone else is doing. I think the neat thing about morning time is it can become a habit. You know, we need to be faithful with our children. We we have them and we need to be faithful to actually teach them if that's what we, the mantle we've taken on. So we we do need to be disciplined, but we also discipline and habit can be small things that build up. Okay, Cindy, one of the questions I get asked is by people who are trying to start the habit of morning time and their kids are not in that kind of preschool set that you can lure in with the nursery rhymes and finger plays and things of that nature. You know, maybe we're talking about people with kids who are 11 to 13 or 14 years old. And moms can really see the fruit or the value of doing a morning time, but they're having a hard time convincing their kids. What kind of advice would you give to a mom in that position? Okay. If it was an older kid, 14 and up, and they were not cooperating. There could be a lot of things going on. Sometimes with an older child, you just have to step back and say, it's okay. I don't have the opportunity to do this with this child and not stress about it and not worry about it. There's a give and take with an older child. Number one, they have to give too, because if it's just that they are stomping their feet and their attitude and you're giving in, then that isn't going to work. You're not really going to be able to homeschool that child at all anyway. Or they may need some time. You may need to just make sure the material you pick out is compelling to them, that they they start to really want to do it because it's interesting to them. For younger kids, I would just say give it some time to sink in. Some kids just like to check off their list. So they're anxious during morning time because, you know, they want to check off. They want to be done with school. And since that's not the point of morning time, that they need to learn that. They need to learn that learning is not about checking off lists, that there's much more to it. And sometimes you can draw them into conversation in morning time. The older kids try. Don't always be the one talking. You know, you can also be the one asking questions or 
you can listen to what they have to say. Make sure it is amazing the places the kids will have insights in the middle of morning time, in a poem, in the middle of a poem, in the middle of Bible verse, in the middle of all kinds of things. Somebody will make a connection and want to share it. And, and that's good. I mean, some kids will hog all the time and that you have to kind of protect the whole family from that because some of the other kids will be, be like, oh, no, we all I don't know if, if you were in college, but. There was always that somebody like that in college, you know, mm-hmm. oh, there he goes. Mm-hmm. The professor's going to let us go, but this guy had to raise his hand, you know. So I think the conversational part of it could, could be enhanced for an older children. And I think even the 10 to 12 crowd, if they think they're participating, it's just like in church where we're participating, you know, the whole liturgy is set up so that the pastor isn't up there doing everything. Church is not about a one man show. It's, it's about us participating in worship. So make sure your children have a chance to participate in morning time, whether it's through reading some of the poems out loud themselves or, you know, whatever through a rich discussion, but it would be better to do less morning time and allow them to participate than to do more. Let's talk a little bit more about the mom's role in morning time. Exactly. If you were describing to someone what the role of the mother was in morning time, how would you describe that? I would say that the mother is the facilitator. She's not really the teacher and she's not. And I love that what you said in your book, she's the fellow traveler in morning time. So she has to be very, very careful that. And I really think morning time. Now, I say this not because I did this well, especially in the early years. I was a great preacher and the kids would always say you could have been a preacher. You know, oh, I would get off on some moral verse and go on and on about it. And when I read Charlotte Mason when I was young and she warned against doing that, but I just regarded that. I thought, well, this is good. This is me. Oh, this verse is so good. I'll expound on it. I could go on for 20 minutes about a Bible verse. And later it just, it came to me really not a way to open the kids' hearts towards the things of the Lord. It was really a way of closing them off. You have to trust the word of God and and the materials that you choose to do the job that you would like it to do, because the more it doesn't affect a small child. They'll listen to you ramble all you want. But later on when they're older, what they will do is they'll turn their hearts off and you don't want that to happen. So it's much better for the mom to be a part of morning time as a fellow learner. And sometimes you're excited about something. So it's okay. You don't have to ever, never share because you are an excited learner. And most homeschooling moms I know are, are excited to learn. They want to learn. So you can quickly overwhelm everyone with that if you're not careful. So the mom does need to be a little bit careful that she lets the Bible speak for itself, lets the connections be made for themselves, and just trust that over time that she's laying a strong foundation. You've obviously, with all of your children, had periods of time where you had a very wide range of ages in your morning time. If, you know, we have a mom who's listening who maybe has seven or eight kids and the oldest is 14 or 15 years old, all the way down to a nursing baby. And they're wondering, how do I find a way to meet the needs of all of these children in morning time? What would you tell them? Well, first of all, I would say what Charlotte Mason says, if you have a mind, your mind needs food and ideas are the food of the mind. And this goes back to the principle that if we're feeding our children real food for their minds, their minds are going to feast on it. Now, obviously, that people are at different levels. But if I'm reading Shakespeare and my three-year-old is in the room, all the better. He's going to get something out of that. And sometimes my kids would just take little Lego men and act out like they could tell when the voices are changing, you know, they would have the other guy do this and the other guy do this. And it was real cute. That, that was a big deal for my little kids to always, oh yeah, we got to get the little men out because we're going to read Shakespeare. So their minds are processing something at that point. I think I had to rearrange when I finally got 14, 15, 16 year olds, I had to rearrange morning time so that the big children weren't, the heart of morning time really wasn't geared toward, they would, any of the read alouds would usually be something the 16 year olds would like, but they could either come or go as they please. But I always did something like Plutarch or Shakespeare early. We would have our Bible reading, sing a song and immediately go into Shakespeare and Plutarch. And then I let the older kids go. 
And then I wouldn't even work with memory work on them. Um, They might have memory work assigned in their schoolwork, but I didn't keep them there for a lot of the poems and and even the review because they did have much more schoolwork to accomplish each day. So I didn't want them to be stressed because they were in morning time too long. So it does come a time we have to say goodbye to, you know, the child and let them out of morning time early. You don't let them out completely because you want to pray with them and you want to have God's word spoken in your home. So, but as far as the older kids go, you do have to, I would say, you know, 14, they can start leaving early. Some 14 year olds won't need to, but some will. And this is going to depend on the workload that they're doing for the rest of their school day. Right. Then with the the kids that you have left, I think I'm hearing you say, go for the ideas with the older kids and let the little ones take what they can from it. Oh, absolutely. You you always are going to, I mean, there comes, a, I think there's a point in no return where you let your older kids go, but you're always going to be going for the oldest kids in the room. You don't want to dumb anything down for anybody. I think that respects the child and it respects the little children too, so that they're rising up to the material rather than everybody coming down to the material. Obviously you're going to read picture books to your little guys some other time. And, you know, you're going to, you're going to do, do things, but there's nothing in morning time that a three-year-old can't take away something from, even if it's just that he heard a funny word and he's going to say it all day or it's not going to harm him in any way to have spent that time, you know, coloring or doing whatever while you're reading aloud or talking about poetry or, you know, sharing or singing. The singing is always great for everyone. Well, now that you're looking back on these years of morning time and you have children who are adults, can you give me some examples of how doing morning time has brought fruit into your kids' lives as they've gotten older? Yeah. And my, the first time I really realized that was something that was going to bear fruit was when my oldest son went into the Navy for a while, he was in a really bad position because he, he wanted to be in special forces, but he had to go into the regular Navy. And it was, he was a little shocking for him. And he was with people he didn't understand. And it was confusing for him. And it was a dark place. You know, you're in a ship and you're out to sea and you have this little berth And he would go, he said he would go stand outside on the deck of the ship and say sunset and evening star and one clear call for me, you know, the Tennyson poem about crossing the bar. And then he, he, when he was on his rock marches later, when he didn't become a seal, but he ended up being a Green Beret. And he, he said, you know, whenever he was trying to get through any tough training, and this is three of my kids have done this. My, I have a son right now at boot camp, and, and he's older and he's going in as, a higher up, but he said, I've used every memory thing I have in my mind, mama. So thank you. You know, thank you for all this stuff you've helped get put here because um, that's how I get through hard things. I say these verses, I say every Bible verse I know and every poem I can think of and um, every, you know, every song, everything he used that his mind was filled with that. And then in college, my one son, who was a little more uh, utilitarian, I have, he's quite a funny fellow, but, um, he said, oh, mama, thank you so much for teaching us Shakespeare. I didn't really like Shakespeare, but man, does it help me get good grades in college and it <laughs> impresses my professor so much when I say something about Shakespeare. So <laughs> so there's that. And I've just seen over and over again, they end up with a, a truly a wide liberal arts base, which is a good base to have. It, it doesn't harm them in any way and it broadens their horizons and it makes it, I especially like about it is it takes a child, let's say it takes a child who's not a genius or not extraordinary, that it's just a normal child, maybe even a slow child. And it gives that child that liberal arts base that absolutely gives him an advantage when he goes to college or when he goes out because he has something to draw out of his mind for any situation. And people turn to him and say, you know, how do you know this? Or how do you know that? And, you know, it allows that child not to be stigmatized by maybe a child in school who would be labeled because they struggle to learn. This child may have struggled to learn, but instead he had this you know, he might have taken four years to learn to read, but he still had a rich heritage and the things that were put in his mind. 
in your Cersei talk, one of my favorite parts of it, I love, you said that morning time is, you did morning time all those years for the time that they're in prison staring at their toes. Oh, yeah. I said when the rats are eating their toes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and truly that is the ultimate thing. And when you die, you know, when you're in the nursing home, when you're old, those are all things that are never going to leave you. You're certainly not going to remember algebra, but you will have God's word in your heart. And if you go to a nursing home and ever walk the aisles and talk to people, um, you'll be so surprised at the scripture that they know or the songs that they can sing from when they were younger. They don't even remember who they are sometimes, but they have these things in their mind that are food for them, even as they're elderly. When we think about education, I think back about my education and so much that I I learned for the test and then forgot and it was lost forever. But just the idea of having this, all of these wonderful things that I, I know that I'm giving to my children that they can carry with them, that I'm learning now that I can carry with me. Um, right. Just right. seems like such a great gift that was never given to me when I was young. No. And I think we all feel that, you know, our children don't have that because they, they had this, but they have, I'm sure they have other things that they get upset about. <laughs> <laughs> But we didn't have that. I, I know I remember graduating from high school and I, I read a lot. So I would read and then I would see, well, I don't know what they're talking about. And that would bother me. It would seem like I had not been taught things that I needed to know. So and, and I know when I started homeschooling, the history was just so rich because I couldn't even have placed George Washington on a timeline when I first started homeschooling, I mean, I knew he was the first president of our country, but that was about it. I didn't, I couldn't have told you when or where or how, you know, he was just the guy on the wall of the school. Mm -hmm. Very true. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for coming today and talking to us a little bit about morning time and what it's done for your family in the past. And I think that the conversation is definitely going to bless a number of other moms as they look forward to maybe implementing starting small and yes. doing some of these practices in their own home. Well, thank you so much for asking me. It's always fun to talk to another mom that's homeschooling. <laughs> okay, this part of the show is going to be one of my absolutely favorite parts, and I'm so excited to share it with you today. This part is called the basket bonus. And we hope to have one of these for every single episode. At the end of each episode, we're going to provide a little goodie for you, a little bonus to help you make a little bit more of what we talked about in the episode and implement some of these practices into your homes and your homeschools. So how can you find these each and every time? Well, you can listen to each episode. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to give you the web address for the show notes for that particular episode. And you'll always find the show notes at the address edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB and the number of the show that you were listening to. So ED Snapshots is my blog. YMB stands for your morning basket. And then the number will stand for the episode number. So for this episode with Cindy, where you would find the show notes is edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB1. And you'll be able to go there and see all of the resources that Cindy and I talked about during the program. And you'll also be able to get links to where any of our guests happen to be on the web. And you'll also be able to download the basket bonus there for each episode. So for this week with Cindy, our basket bonus is a set of study guide questions for the book for the children's sake. Now, this is a book that Cindy said was pivotal for her own implementation of morning time and her own understanding of how education could be different from what she knew. And it's not a very long book. It's six chapters long. It will definitely bless you as you take the time to read it. And so we've got a set of study questions there that you can download and you can either use by yourself as you study through the book, or you could use them with another small group of women as you study through the book together. So to get your basket bonus for episode one of the Your Morning Basket podcast, go to edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB1. 
And there you have it. Episode one of the Your Morning Basket podcast is in the books. And I just want to thank Cindy Rollins again for coming on here and blessing us and speaking to our hearts about morning time and what it has done for her family for all of these years and hopefully inspired us to think about what it might do for our own families. I know it sure does bless mine. If you would like to leave a comment or a question for either myself or for Cindy, you can do that at the show notes at edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB1. And if you like the podcast, I would love for you to head on over to iTunes and leave a rating or review over there. Ratings and reviews on iTunes help the podcast to be seen by more people who might be looking for just this kind of thing. And we thank you very much for taking the time to head on over there and do that. And that's it for the very first episode of Your Morning Basket. We look forward to seeing you back in a couple of weeks where we'll chat more about truth, goodness, and beauty in your morning basket. Mm -hmm.